So uh, it's a pleasure to finally introduce the approach that we are following in the SVK interview, which is vertical gun on foreign substrates. And thankfully, we've already had quite a few speakers doing the typical introductory work, so I'll try to be as fast as possible with the introductory stuff so that have more time for the same one. Uh, so yeah, we've heard it quite a few times now that natural gun is pretty good technology for the low voltage plus, so up to 650 volt approximately. Because there we can really uh, make use of the benefits of the low onboard systems of the tuning and also the high switching speeds. Also, this is quite good from a cost point of view because we're using atrial and detectional growth of GAN on cheap uh, silicon substrates, which are available in large diameter. But this technology doesn't scale very favorably to high on blocking voltages and also high on state current. So, there, this is where vertical silicon carbide shines, so beyond 650 volts. The uh, vertical architecture is scaled just by increasing the drift layer thickness. Also, because of having like, large pads on front and back side, you can easily use higher on-state currents. But as we heard millions of times now, the native substrate is quite expensive, and this drives the cost of this technology. So if we now think about vertical gun, then from this R1 times A versus voltage rating uh, graph in the center, you can see that beyond 650 volts vertical gun can, in principle, even beat silicon carbide. But then the question uh, arises, how do we tackle this? So the most straightforward approach would be to say, OK, yeah, we just take a native gun substrate, so not silicon, but a native gun substrate, grow our empty layers, and fabricate the vertical device. But then we end up with the same problems, and even worse, because the other nitride is even more expensive than SVR, available only in very small diameters. But we know that there is actually a solution to this, so we can use hydro potential growth of Gantron foreign substrate to reduce the cost and have large diameter uh, substrates available. But there's a problem attached to this, and this is that for all choice of substrates that we have, either the substrate itself is an insulator, or we have at least one insulating um, layer in the current path due to the eddy growth. And therefore, a priori, we cannot use such a layer for vertical conduction. But what you can do, at least on paper, is um, to remove the substrate and all your insulating layers under your active area of your transistors and thereby um, create something that we call a vertical gun membrane transistor because we really strip the transistor to its core functionality. So we have a detectional gun here in the active area cladded by both sides with a metallization, that's it. And as usual, these uh, cross-sections are quite misleading. So in the lateral dimension, we're talking about millimeter size, so typical power transistors. Whereas the thickness of such a stack would be few to 10 microns of gun collided by metallization on the front side, which is really resembles a membrane. And then we have achieved just that. So combining the low-cost gun heterodotaxy with the vertical um, gun transistor performance. And yeah, of course, this can easily be drawn. But the question is, can we actually do this? And this is what we uh, try to achieve in SVGAN. So, um, what you need to do is you basically need to have a look at the whole value chain as we heard many times uh, during this summer school so far. So we start with the epitaxy because what you need to grow is actually quite different than what we need for a hand. Uh, so a hand stack is actually what we try to grow a thick insulator which does not uh, degrade the two-day performance. Now for this heterotaxy for a vertical device we need to grow a drift layer, so also a thick layer with a control low level of doping so that you can block and conduct with the same layer. This, in, in, uh, yes again, we do on silicon and on sapphire, and we target the blocking voltage range from 650 to 1200 volts. That means we need layer thicknesses depending on the crystal quality of 4 to around 10 microns. Next step is then tip, uh, tip technology, so the front side processing that defines the transistor concept and the channel. We have heard from Enrico this morning about FinFETs. This is part of the processing in SVGAN. There are also other partners, including us, uh, who are working on MOSFET concepts for the channel. Then the probably most distinguishing feature of this technology is what we call the membrane processing. So the backside processing in order to get access from the backside to the semiconductor layers and the metallizations. And then the wafer uh, processing is finished. But we do not stop there, but we continue with the assembly interconnection technology to learn how to handle these chips with these thin membranes and how to connect them to the outside world, and then also test them ideally in some applications. And today I want to focus on uh, these three aspects. So we already heard about chip technology here in the morning, and these three are really those that differentiate 
uh, vertical gum on foreign substrates from vertical gum on native substrates. So, um, as partially a reminder, but with another um, focus in mind, I would like to speak again about the possible choice of substrates that we have apart from the native gum. So, yeah, in this morning we already uh, heard that uh, lattice mismatch, even more important, the CTE mismatch of your AP layer to the substrate is important for the architectural growth. And the standard substrates that have been discussed so far are silicon 111, sapphire, and silicon carbide. And I just throw in another one. It has been mentioned in one or two talks already, but there's a mysterious uh, one called QST, which is an engineered substrate, quite similar as uh, the smart stick is an engineered substrate for silicon carbide. QST is an engineered substrate for uh, gamma nitride probe. And on the right hand side, you can see a, a qualitative cost graph that shows you, you mentioned this to be a log scale, what the cost per area of these different substrates plus the gun AP layer is uh, today, it's a dot, and which wafer diameter and cost is uh, going to evolve out of it. So, native gun, that's not a surprise, what we discussed so far already. So, this is 2 inch to 4 inch nowadays. Japanese groups have already demonstrated 6 inch. There is benefits or potential in cost reduction in the future, but uh, at the moment this is still uh, very high in terms of cost, which is the reason why we're looking for an alternative here. Um, from a potential point of view, silicon carbide is actually quite attractive, has a low CTE mismatch, but is actually expensive, and what we're trying to do with the again is to beat uh, silicon carbide in the cost, so also pretty much a, a no-go. The other two cheap options would be silicon and sapphire. Here it's important to know that regarding the CTE mismatch, uh, silicon has a um, lower um, CTE than gallium nitride, so during the growth, or more uh, importantly during the cool down, gallium nitride will contract more than silicon. This is exactly the other way around for sapphire. So sapphire has a higher CTE, so the substrate will contract more during the cool down than um, the gun EP layer will. In terms of wafer sizes, so silicon, of course, is available for, for gun on silicon native taxi readily at 200 millimeter. Nowadays, there have even been demonstrations for 300 millimeter already, and this is where the journey is heading. Sapphire is somewhere uh, in the range of 150 to 200 millimeter. And then last but not least, this uh, mysterious QST, I'll talk in more depth about this later. As I said, it is an engineered substrate with exactly this in mind to engineer the substrate such that the Q, uh, CTE mismatch to gallium nitride is low, so that you can easily grow the layers on this. And this substrate is nowadays already available at 200 millimeter, and at least from the process point of view, there is no reason why not to scale it up even to uh, higher diameters. So that's a rough um, overview picture. In this again, we focus on sapphire and silicon, and I will dive a bit more into these different choices on the next slides. But uh, before I do so, and there was a question about this actually this morning, I'd quickly like to discuss pseudo-vertical versus fully vertical devices because we'll encounter this in the next slides uh, quite a lot. So uh, when we talk about a pseudo-vertical, sometimes also quasi-vertical um, device, what we mean is that we have actually the full device spec, so we start with a substrate and maybe it takes buffer layers. Typically, we always have an N plus grain layer at the bottom, then the drift layer and transistor or die or whatever structures on the front side, and the typical front side pads, so sorting gate, for example. And then, in order to access the grain and circumvent this uh, backside process, <laughs> what you can do is just etch down through all your drift layers and put a drain pad on the N plus layer. So the current then has first to flow vertically, as it would in a fully vertical structure, and then laterally to the drain pad. This is easier to fabricate because you don't have to do the backside process. Um, you can also really probe this vertical current flow, but I really want to stress that this is by no means a solution for a real device because you lose a lot of area by this drain pad. Also, when you scale things up, getting your current efficiently in and out of your device is a nightmare. And you can only do wiring on the front side, so this is really not a good solution. So in order to bring something like this into something commercial, we need to find a solution to make a fully vertical device to contact this N plus layer from the backside that we just have it, this vertical current flow, and then we can uh, harness all the advantages of a vertical, um, yeah, vertical device. So this is just uh, as a side mark before we dive into the different substrates. So a uh, few words on silicon. I won't spend too much time here. We've heard a lot about uh, gallon silicon EP growth. So just a reminder again, while 
in a tent to try to grow an insulator, which does not uh, yeah, make our channel verse here. Uh, and the buffer then, so for example, this train super list is the insulator. Here, we only need the buffer in order to enable the growth of the gallon nitrogen on top. Because if we don't have the buffer as a strain uh, engineering structure, then the gun layers would contract during cooldown and destroy our whole wave roll, or at least bow it that much that we cannot uh, work with it anymore in, in a fab. So um, the idea to circumvent this that is then typically used is to build up compressive stress during growth, and such a typical buffer does exactly that. So we grow more gallium-containing layers on top of more aluminum-containing layers. They have a lower lattice constant and therefore grow compressively in the epigrowth. So in Mr. Schindler's talk, we already saw these, these bow graphs. So during the growth at high temperature, um, stacking these layers on top builds up compressive stress as the layer thickness increases. And if you do this right, then during cooldown, when the 3,5 nitride layer stacks contracts, then you end up with a pretty much flat wafer, which is what you intend to do. Um, you have different ways how you can build up this buffer. So you always start with this aluminum nitride nucleation layer. This uh, yeah, is a template for your subsequent gun growth and also protects your silicon wafer from the gallium um, atoms. There would be a reaction between these two, and this is what you suppress by this aluminum nitride nucleation layer. Then you have different choices how to continue. So either the strain super lattice with the stack layer pairs or an argon step graded layer where you gradually tune the lattice constant to the device gun. But nevertheless, on top of this, you need to grow several micron up to 10, ideally, uh, of gallium nitrogen or to enable these high blocking voltages. Um, some things to, to note. So obviously, at least aluminum nitride, that's always an insulator. So there is no way to have the vertical current flow in this structure. That's what we need to remove it in the end. And the challenges here are really the high mismatch uh, thermally between these two substrates. So at some point, you will be limited in the growth, how much strain you can build up here before you start to introduce slip lines in the silicon and then degrade your crystal. So we cannot unlimitedly strain the silicon, and this will uh, limit the achievable thickness at some point. Also, even if you have a flat wafer over here, the stack on top is internally strained, and this makes the wafer quite fragile. So especially during high temperature processing, this can cause problems in the line. So um, some results from the project, and this has actually been obtained by collaboration of Siltronic and CNRS, and the guys who did the work, Sante and Yusef and Iblis, they're also in the audience, so if you have more questions, you can also address them. So what you see here on the left is a test structure, actually a pseudo-vertical device, as discussed previously. It's a P and diet, so we have the N plus drain layer, a thick uh, either 3.5 or 4.5 micron drift layer, and then a P gun on top, and then P contact here and N contact here. Um, as you can see then on the graph on the right hand side, so in the forward direction, the P and diet uh, switches on. There's a bit, uh, higher voltage drop than desired, but nevertheless, like, it switches on. We have a linear regime here, and then from the differential R1 times A, this is essentially the resistance then of the drift layer. You can see here in this linear regime that the drift layer contribution is quite low with only 0.35 milliohms per centimeter. And the interesting question is how does this block? So the bad crystal quality that we heard that comes inherently with the heterotextual growth, how does it limit the blocking capability? Well, over here you can see the reverse characteristics for the two thicknesses, and these break down at 640 or 820 volts, respectively, which translates to a uh, breakdown field of around 1.8 megavolt per centimeter. This is not the ceiling that could, in principle, be reached, but already uh, pretty good. And, uh, well, Fabi uh, disclosed it yesterday already. It's not published yet, but uh, these uh, layers even show Joe Avalanche, which is a uh, total novelty for gun silk. And if you had Ask anybody like five years ago, is it possible to reach avalanche with gamma silicon heteroprotects? The answer would have been uh, no, right? never. Defect density is just too high. So, this is really uh, yeah, a, a great result that has been shown here. So, that much for now for gamma silicon. Let's move on to sapphire. Uh, so, sapphire for uh, power is rather uncommon. There's just a single hemp manufacturer, which is power integrations, that uses um, gamma sapphire for their hemp. It's, of course, the standard in the optoelectronics industry. Also, sapphire is not necessarily usable in every fab because of the transparency of the substrate. Um, apart from this, well, here you can see like a typical LED stack, so uh, N-gun, then the multiple quantum wells, and then the P-gun on top. 
a vertical power stack doesn't look that different, so we would just include this N plus gun for the drain layer uh, somewhere in the stack, perhaps have some uh, yeah, further undoped gun to improve the crystal quality and then grow the thick uh, drift layer uh, on top. A um, few notes again, so here uh, there is no silicon involved in the substrate, so this uh, silicon metal etching that I mentioned previously is not an issue, so renucleation can be done differently you know, with aluminum nitride or gallium nitride. I think aluminum nitride is more common. Um, but, uh, this is important, the CTE of the substrate is higher than this for, uh, for the AP layers, so the substrate will contract more during cooldown than the AP layer will. So you cannot play this neat trick to uh, build up compressive stress during the growth in order to counteract this. So this uh, might also uh, result in a problem later on. Um, yeah, nonetheless, let's do the same trick uh, or play the same game and have a look at breakdown results. So this has been done by FBH, uh, so the work from Enrico and Ella Bartheidel. It's the same kind of structure. It's a pseudo-vertical PN diet here grown on a 5 micron drift layer. And uh, you can see here in the center there, uh, the doping of the drift layer was varied from uh, yeah, mid E16 to mid E15. You can see that with a reduction of the doping, as expected, the uh, breakdown voltage increases. Um, this is all hard breakdown, but here on the right hand side, you can see now this data is already published, so I can show it. Uh, you can see the temperature dependence of the breakdown of this uh, 4016 um, AD. And you can see that with increasing temperature, the breakdown shifts to higher voltages. Also, there's a reversible non-destructive breakdown. That's exactly the signature of avalanche. So yeah, this is, apart from the uh, demonstration of avalanche on silicon, also a demonstration on sapphire, which itself is also a uh, great result. So congratulations to that. And this shows that yeah, a crystal quality that a few years ago would not have been thought to be achievable is actually achievable. I'm not talking about um, the leakage current, so this is probably still higher than what uh, one would want to have, but yeah, I mean, we need to improve the future as well. Um, yeah, so that much on Sapphire. Now uh, turning to this mysterious uh, QST. Uh, so QST stands for Promise Substrate Technology. Promise is just a, the company that has the IP for this. Um, and as I said, the idea is to make an engineered substrate whose refractive index, uh, refractive index CTE is matched to, to gallium nitride. And how this is done is the following way. So you choose a core material with head, which has this matching, this, in this case, a uh, poorly aluminum nitride ceramic, which is then cladded by several uh, sort of engineered layers. And then you use a process very similar to an SOI process to bond a silicon 111 uh, wafer on the surface with a buried oxide and thin that down. And this is then later your uh, yeah, basis for the architectural growth. Uh, the nice thing about this is that uh, to the outside, so to the fat basically, it looks almost like a silicon wafer. So the specifications are the same, contamination they have in control, so they are running this in commercial fabs already. Here you can see a demonstration of a 200 millimeter wafer, so they have 150, 200 millimeter wafers uh, that can be used. And uh, at the moment, the main goal is to uh, produce hemp on this, um, yeah, which then show a higher yield and less breakage of these wafers in the fab. But since uh, this core is matched in the CTE, so here in this, uh, you can even see that it's matched over temperature, so yeah, it will be hard to read, but uh, the blue dots here are gallium nitride, the turquoise dots here are polyaluminum nitride, so the CTE matching is really actually good, also over broad temperature range, so it's possible to also grow thick AP layers, and here there are some cross-sectional examples of up to 30 micron gun grown on such a QST wafer. And uh, therefore, there's obviously also work on um, vertical, uh, yeah, vertical stacks on this. This is all results that have been uh, achieved in the uh, frame of the Ultimate GAN um, project, collaboration of IMAC with Eikstron, and the substrates coming from Gromis. So here in the center, you can see results for a uh, breakdown of, again, a pseudo-vertical PN diet with 5 micron drift epitaxy. And you can see that this is, again, a hard breakdown happening at 800 volts, so actually quite comparable to what we have shown on silica and on sapphire. But you have obviously the option to increase this thickness of the gun layer way more easily than is the case on silicon and or sapphire. So here, for example, uh, 12 micron. And they've also worked on uh, transistor uh, demonstrators in a pseudo-vertical configuration 
which I won't uh, dive more into detail, that is their work. So, uh, but just to like, give you the complete picture of the available substrates for such a vertical gun on foreign substrates approach. So, uh, leaving Ibitaxi behind and um, continuing with the backside process. So I just assume we have the AP wafer now, we have produced a thin fat MOSFET, whatever, on the front side, so the wafer is finished and we can continue with the backside processing. How do we do this to create these membranes without uh, destroying the wafer that we have? So the general idea is the following. We take the wafer, flip it upside down, and temporarily attach it to a carrier wafer with a process called temporary bonding. And I'll dig into the individual processes in more detail afterwards. This carrier then stabilizes and protects the front side during um, the backside processing, and then we can use etching processes to remove the silicon, stopping on the buffer layer, and then also removing the buffer, stopping in this N plus gun layer, which then yeah, exposes the EP so that we can contact the conductive layers from the backside. So we have on the one hand a contact metallization to form on a contact, and then a reinforcing metallization to thicken up the metal, make it more stable, and also improve the thermals and electrics. Um, yeah, and then we use a process called laser debonding to get rid of this carrier, to so lift it up from the um, from the wafer, and then we're done. Um, as easy as it is. <laughs> as a demonstrator here on the right hand side, you can see a uh, let's say a gun on silicon wafer, actually a, a hemmed stack uh, with a four micron thick gun epitaxy, where we removed the backside, uh, so the silicon underneath areas of up to five millimeter diameter, so that's uh, one hundred fifty millimeter wafer. And, well, it looks like a wafer with holes, because the white band gap material that is still uh, remaining in this holes is a white band gap material, so it's transparent and visible, but probably down here from the reflection you can see that there is actually still something, and this still something is nothing but a 4 micron thick uh, EP layer. Zero cracks over a 150 millimeter wafer, so quite a nice demonstration that this is not a neat university trick that you can do on a coupon, but it's really feasible to do it also on full wafer level. So, um, let's dig a bit more into these individual processes. So first, um, bonding. This is by courtesy of our partners EEG. Um, so, um, temporary bonding is actually an established solution that is used in uh, different industries where uh, thin wafers are involved. So we heard this morning from ST that uh, the uh, silicon power wafers can also go down to thicknesses of uh, yeah, 50 microns or so. Uh, so, if you need to stabilize uh, such a thin wafer, um, temporary bonding is a possible solution. So, it basically means you have a carrier and a device wafer. You spin a temporary adhesive, similar to photoresist on one of them, uh, bond them together at uh, moderate temperatures and some force. And then, depending on the uh, type of adhesive material that you use, you can make use of different debond principles. And you can either debond uh, the wafer by itself or attach it to a dicing frame beforehand so that if it is too fragile, it is already stabilized by a dice tape. Um, yeah, three types of uh, debond methods can be um, differentiated. One of the thermal slide-off debond, laser debond, and mechanical debond. And yeah, thermal slide-off means you have a um, thermoplastic um, adhesive so that the adhesive gets so soft when you heat it slightly up that then you can slide off uh, the carrier from your device wafer, you clean your device wafer, and that's it. The variant that we use here in the SVGN is called laser debond. So the idea here is that you use a, a double stack of two adhesives, and one of them is UV active. So if you expose it with a UV laser, it uses it loses its adhesion. And what you then do is you use a transparent carrier, so glass wafer for example, and bond this to your device wafer. Then you have the UV laser which scans through the backside of this glass wafer, and then you can really lift it free of force. So we do this in order not to damage the membranes afterwards, and again, some cleaning involved. And last but not least, if you have a device wafer which is well, which can uh, lift with some more force, then there's also the opportunity to do a mechanical debond, uh, which we don't make use of in yes we can. So temporary bonding and debonding. How do we get rid of the silicon? Um, this is the slide that, as a member of Bosch, I have to present because the process that is used to remove silicon anisotropically uh, was invented by Bosch. It's also known as the Bosch process in the world. It's so-called deep reactive ion etching. The problem with plasma etching of silicon is that um, 
the etchin, which is uh, sulfur hexafluoride, etches quite isotropically, so the fluoride radicals which are created in the plasma, they react with the silicon, forming silicon tetrafluoride. This is volatile at low pressures, but um, you do not really have a directionality. It's just, it under etches your mass and widens the etch. So if you want to be able to make um, yeah, a, a vertical etch, then there's a trick you can play, which is cycling this uh, etching step with a passivation step. So you can use uh, C4F8 uh, gas, also in the plasma, which if you crack it in the plasma, deposits as a kind of Teflon-like passivation layer over all your structures. And the idea is that to have one step that um, deposits this passivation, in the next step you remove the passivation just at the bottom. This is done by uh, having the plasma with some uh, bias to have uh, directional incidence of your ions on the bottom here, on the surface, but this leaves the passivation here on the sidewalls. So then in the next step, uh, you can use uh, the isotropic edge step, so just the SF6 plasma, to etch deeper here in the bottom while the sidewall is protected, and this is then cycled. Uh, it's a typical process in the especially micro um, electromechanical systems um, world, so all the acceleration sensors and inertial sensors in your smartphone use exactly this uh, process um, with some variations. So in this case you do uh, not that deep but narrow trenches. What we need is we need to go deep into the material, so we need hundreds of micron deep trenches, which can also be done with such a process. So here's an example where we just etched uh, 600 micron deep into silicon. For the gallon silicon membrane wafers, we usually thin down the silicon before so that the residual thickness is less and we do not have to etch uh, so deep. One thing to note here, which is super helpful, if not uh, a savior for us, is that the human nitride, on the other hand, is very inert to SF6 if there is no additional ion bombardment. So it is almost a no-brainer and a perfect etch stop to stop the silicon etching once we have reached the nucleation layer of the gun buffer. So we could really over-etch over the wafer for a duration that would remove 50 microns of uh, silicon without removing a considerable amount of aluminum nitride. And this is really, it saves us, because otherwise, with the process of homogeneities, there would be no way to stop this in a controlled way on the buffer. So, yeah, good luck in this sense. Um, so, now we basically have uh, removed the silicon wafer underneath our active area and have stopped on the aluminum nitride nucleation layer. So the next thing is removing the layer that's actually hurting us, so the insulator, which is the gun buffer layers, um, and this needs to be done by chlorine plasma etching, and we have heard it uh, this morning already, selectivity between chlorine plasma and different uh, argon compounds is uh, very low. So here there's no way to design a process such that it would only remove the buffer layers and selectively stop here on this N plus uh, gun drain layer. So you need to have good process uh, control, first of all, a homogeneous process and a well-controlled process that tells you when you need to stop. And one way to do this is by using optical emission spectroscopy, it's also standard in etching tools, so you monitor the intensity of atomic lines of your etch products uh, or uh, educts, and um, then you can see where you are on your stack. And here you can see an example of this, where we monitor uh, gallium and aluminum chloride, signal and the nitrogen signal, and you can easily distinguish the different phases of your, uh, of your buffer. So after removing the aluminum nitride uh, nucleation layer, gun signal goes up, al um, aluminum signal goes down, then there's an intermediate argon layer here, afterwards you reach the strain super lattice with an even higher uh, gun um, compound, and then um, when you've uh, removed this one, then you're ending up in pure gun, so this can easily be seen and the process be stopped uh, accordingly. So, uh, again, this works quite nicely and means that we do not need to grow that thick of an N-plus layer, uh, which compromises the thickness of the drift layer, which we can grow uh, on top. So, uh, yeah, this saves us some, some headache. So, that's the way how we can reach uh, the N-plus gun layer from the backside for the gun slip. Yes. How about gun and sapphire? Here the situation is a bit uh, different because sapphire cannot really be etched uh, by dry plasma chemistry. Uh, but there is another trick which has already been uh, established in the LED industry and this is called laser liftoff. Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, the band gaps of sapphire and, um, and gallium nitride are uh, quite wide apart. So uh, sapphire has a band gap, or yeah, it's an insulator, but at some point there's a band gap of uh, seven electron volts 
and this translates into the absorption wavelength of 177 nanometers. Whereas for gun, we know it's 3.5 electron volts, and this is around 360 nanometers. So any wavelength in between would transmit through the sapphire, but be readily absorbed in the gallium nitride, because gallium nitride is a direct semiconductor, so the absorption length is quite low. Um, so the idea is then to scan it through the backside with a UV laser. In between these, typically it's an XMR laser at around 250 nanometers, and then this laser light is absorbed here at the interface, and uh, this heats up uh, the interface, gallium decomposes into metallic gallium and nitrogen. Nitrogen can escape outwards and leaves back uh, uh, gallium residue. Now gallium has quite a low melting point, so that's around 30 degrees, so if you heat this up beyond this, then your sapphire wafer is kind of floating on the, um, yeah, on the bonded gun um, substrate, so you can lift this off, remove these residues, and etch damage that, uh, or additional uh, damage, etch a bit further that you end up in this N plus gun layer, and uh, that's it. So, as opposed to the gun on silicon um, route, here we always have to remove the full sapphire wafer, and in principle, the sapphire wafer uh, could even be reused for, for the FX. So, a different uh, route to tackle this problem. So, now we have the N plus gun exposed, and we need to form an omic contact on this. Um, and this is actually harder than you would think, um, because uh, two different reasons. One of them is we have this temporary adhesive here on the front side, and this has a maximum temperature of around 300 to 350 degrees centigrade that it can withstand. We heard this morning uh, during the uh, talk by Enrico that typical annealing temperatures for end contacts on the front side are at 500 degrees and beyond. So standard annealing would be uh, no option here. The second uh, thing that makes this process more difficult is that here we're working on the backside of the gallium nitride. So on silicon, gallium nitride always grows in the 111, uh, sorry, 0001 direction. Uh, it's the gallium phase on the front side. This is chemically very stable, whereas the backside, the nitrogen phase, is chemically very unstable. So it readily oxidizes and um, the, the contact formation chemistry is not the same as on the front side. And uh, there are two different um, solutions. So uh, Fahir also in his talk showed yesterday morning that his group is uh, following a solution which uses a chemical surface pretreatment for the um, uh, for the metallization. Uh, we are following a different approach. So um, um, we uh, think that laser kneading is also an option. And uh, partners of ours in the project have done temperature simulations uh, where you see that using such a UV laser that scans over the backside. So it's a pulse laser and therefore the energy intake is uh, limited in, uh, in space and time, so only a small section is heated up for a short amount of time, and then the heat mostly diffuses laterally in the metallization, and uh, vertically the temperature drops quite quickly so that when you have reached this adhesive, you are below this uh, adhesive limit. And on the right hand side you can see uh, how the contact resistance of a deposited metallization changes with the applied laser fluence. So you see that starting with a bad contact here, which is non-annealed, after a certain threshold of the laser fluence, the contact resistance drops uh, dramatically, the contacts become ohmic, and we are ending up in a micro-ohm to 10 micro-ohm square centimeter contact resistance range, which is a really good result. So I think that's what I want to show for the back side, if I'm not mistaken. No, results. Oh, that was the process. Let's have a look at results. Um, so, um, you might have already seen it yesterday on the posters of, uh, of CNRS. So um, they fabricated not only these um, pseudo-vertical PN diodes, but on the same wafer also a fully vertical PN diode. So here the substrate is removed and the backside is contacted. And then they compared the backside uh, reverse um, conduction through these uh, PN diodes. And you can see that between the quasi-vertical, pseudo-vertical, and fully vertical structure, there's no difference. So this means by this um, backside process, underneath our active API layer, there's no damage inflicted, no additional leakage mechanism uh, that would degrade these uh, diets, which is a uh, really nice uh, result. Um, we also um, did something similar. So uh, we fabricated not PN diets, but Schottky diets uh, on a full wafer. So here you can see 150 millimeter gallon silicon wafer after this front and backside um, process. 
uh, something which is quite nice about this gallon silicon processing is that when you remove the silicon underneath your active structures, then everything becomes transparent. So the gum is transparent, so you can see through the silicon your active layers, in this case it's metallization pads, on the front side. That's optically very rewarding like when you see this at some point. And um, yeah, down here you can see um, the blocking characteristics uh, on the left side, and here the forward characteristics. So um, there were some problems in the process. Leakage is quite high. We have a serious resistance there, but I mean, nevertheless, this is uh, clearly a, a rectifying uh, diet, and it shows that it's possible to have the vertical current flow. And even more importantly, it shows that it's also possible to do this on wafer levels, so not as I said, just a uh, universities can achieve it on some devices on a coupon, but it works consistently also on the full wafers, which is important for us to, to check. So, um, finally, I would like to say a few words about assembly interconnection technology. So let's assume that the wafer is finished. Um, I work myself in device technology, so I think now the, the hard part is over. That's of course not true. Also, uh, it is hard to contact um, such chips to sinter them, to bond wires to them, because they look quite different than what uh, yeah, people are typically uh, used to work with. So, on the one hand, we have the thin uh, gun membranes, we have the backside topography, so yeah, high topography in these dyes. So, you may ask questions, okay, how do they behave under pressure, how do they deform, how is the thermal management when we have this backside cavity? So, within the SVN, we're looking at different solution paths, so easy ones like thinning down the substrate as much as possible prior to the AIT to uh, reduce this topography as much as possible or thickening up the metallization. Um, but then we have partners which implement special methods in order to deal with the topography. So this is results from farm of ISB. They use an approach where they uh, use a laser to structure uh, a direct uh, bonded copper substrate so that the substrate has the yeah, pretty much inverse topography to the gun chip which they then embed in it and solder or sinter from the other side another substrate to it. Down here you can see a cross-section through such a device, so these bars here are the, the silicon frame. Uh, this is the, the copper here from the substrate from the top and the bottom. And in the center here, this very thin uh, black line, this is the, the gun membrane with the solder or sinter paste on both sides. And this is nice because it's a very low inductive solution. Uh, low bond wires involved, and of course you can bring your heat sink very close to the airport, to the point where the heat is created, so there is no uh, substrate with additional thermal resistance in between. Uh, another option also by one of our partners, NanoWired, um, similar idea in mind, so they uh, grew uh, by electroplating through a 3D printed uh, mask, uh, they grew uh, kind of a pedestal that exactly fits in this cavity, it's a bit difficult to see in this cross-section, but like uh, this is again one of these chips, so here that's the silicon. If we zoom in, we cannot even see the membrane, it's so thin, but they use this approach uh, with the shot device I showed you on the previous slide, and you can see the uh, results here, so the, the blue dots are the characteristic uh, before the dye attach uh, to the substrate, and the red curve is afterwards, so you can see that the dye characteristic is preserved, it's still blocking and conducting, so no unwanted shorts, um, seem to work quite well. And uh, last but not least, you might also ask about what about bonding on this. So uh, what we try here is um, to sinter such a chip um, face down, so with the, with the membrane top side uh, sintered directly on, on the DVC substrate. And then a colleague of ours uh, connected um, bond wires to the back side of this membrane. So at this point the membrane is, is fully supported from the front side the same as it would be if we had such a pedestal on the back side. Um, and then you perform pull tests. So you like take a, take a hook, uh, hook it into one of these uh, bond wires and pull until it fails. And what you want to see is that failure occurs at some point uh, in the bond wire. So the bond wire itself, depending on its material properties, is the weakest point and it's not the bond foot that detaches or in our case we were of course um, a bit worried that we might damage the membrane by doing so. But down here you can see a cross-section here through this uh, yeah, um, line, it's hard to see, yeah, but this is going directly through the bond foot of one of these bond wires that has seen the pull test, so quite a significant force on this. And down here it's results, so this is the substrate. Again, this very thin uh, black uh, line here is the gun membrane, and here on top you have the, the bond foot. So the membrane looks as 
you know, safe and healthy as it might look from the cross section. So again, quite a, a nice and, and good result. And this then opened up questions for us whether we might even go a step further and remove even the stabilizing silicon frame uh, to have nothing left but a thin gallium nitride foil with metallizations on two sides, so that would be then called a, a foil chip, and what's what you see here. This is no electrical functionality, it's just gun uh, EP with metallizations on two sides. We just want to see whether this uh, works from a stability point of view, and as well, this one could be quite easily sintered and bond wires attached uh, to this. So this might be another way how to tackle such a, a backside approach with obviously um, <coughs> even more um, advantages from the thermal and electrical point of view. So that's all what I wanted to show you today. So let's uh, quickly uh, sum up. So um, it's quite a neat idea to use heteroprotection growth on foreign substrates, also for vertical devices, because it can allow us to reduce the cost and also work readily with available large diameter substrates, as opposed to waiting until the crystal growers have finally achieved um, large wafers. Um, there are different choice of substrates, which I quickly discussed. Each of them come with its own uh, specifics, or uh, pros and cons. So silicon is cheap. It also has quite a simple extra removal process, because you can still easily etch silicon in plasma processes. But silicon is fragile, and we do not yet know at what point uh, thickness limitation will uh, limit us in the achievable blocking voltage. At the moment, we are in the range of around 820 that has been demonstrated, and our project partners are working on increasing this. For sapphire, we have also excellent AP results, also showing avalanche, as is the case on silicon. Uh, here, the backside is different. Uh, you need to use this laser lift of process in order to get rid of the substrate. Um, but the AP is totally different than on, uh, on silicon, and there might be additional barriers for introducing uh, these wafers into conventional fast. Uh, and I also introduced you to the QST, which is really an attractive choice for even thicker gun EP layers. Um, but uh, yeah, we will need to see how the cost and also how to there uh, have a backside concept to remove these polyaluminum nitride core layers can look like this. Yeah, what I showed you for silicon and sapphire for sure won't work the same way for, for QST. So we have shown such backside processes for gallon silicon now, both on coupon and wafer level. So this is important for us to know that there is not a barrier that will at some point uh, pop up when we transfer things to actual wafer level. And I also showed you some of the new innovative AIT solutions that we're testing in to again uh, yeah, to connect these gallon silicon dyes to the outside world. So I hope I could raise your interest in the, in the general topic. We find it very exciting and uh, we have a lot of uh, carefully maintained social media channels, which are maintained by Sophie. So we'd be happy if we have a few more LinkedIn or Twitter followers on our page uh, after this talk. And now I'm open to questions.